This is Donna with More Than a Review and just excited to be able to be here with Dana and to help talk about her book, Holding On Loosely. Just an excellent book for, you know, I would say for this time, but I think we've always been holding on to stuff um, so yeah. tightly and I yeah. think we just, we just want things faster and we want things resolved quickly and we just hold on to this anxiety of just things. Um, so I just think this is a great time um, to kind of share this type of book with people yeah. and help us to just let go. <laughs> hold on a lot less loosely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Dana, go ahead for um, people that might be new to you, share a little bit about yourself. Yeah, first of all, thank you yeah, well, for having me. Um, I live in uh, a small town called Lano in Texas outside of Austin. I'm married, have been married for pushing 40 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, the mom of three adult children and now for a new grandchild. Oh. And uh, most of them are very far away and miles from me right now. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that is great. So let's talk about um, Holding On Loosely. Mm -hmm. Tell us kind of a little bit about the book and then we'll kind of dive into what led you to write it. Yeah, okay, that's great. So Holding On Loosely um, came out of, of a time when I realized the flurry of life. Life was speeding by. We'd become overly busy helicopter parents. We've become intolerant. Uh, we've become social media junkies. And to the point that I feel we're walking around with our, our stomachs in a knot half of the time. Yeah. And I wondered what it would feel like if we could just open our hands and just turn loose. And so the book came out of, uh, out of that, and um, Mary Oliver has a quote of three ways to walk through life. Um, paying attention, being astonished, and then telling about it. So that, that basically is the book, is being a, God showing me through stories. I mean, he, he spoke to his disciples through parables. And I listened, and I don't think he's quit telling us stories. Mm -hmm. And so my interactions with... Um, regular people on a very ordinary day. Uh, there are 33 stories in the book of, of those kinds of interactions. Uh, people mostly had no idea that they were showing me something really that would change my life and the way I held on to certain things. Mm -hmm. Though the book is not prescriptive, um, it's a storybook. Mm -hmm. It's a storybook of my history of clinging and my desire to turn loose and walk a better way through the rest of my life. Yeah. And you know, I think what an encouragement to other people to not realize that you are impacting others. You know, like yeah. the people yes. that you know you talk about yeah. in the stories, they may not have realized it at the time. Yes. But um, those little things matter. They do matter. Those conversations matter. Yeah. yeah. They do. So I always like to ask what is the favorite chapter to write and then maybe what was the hardest? Okay. Uh, the favorite chapter to, oh goodness, there are so many, but <laughs> I will tell you one of my very favorites um, was a, a, a chapter called Rina. And Rina, she oh. corrected me, it was a woman, <laughs> uh, an elderly woman that uh, I met uh, on a trip to New York last night there. My husband and I were at a pizza joint and mm -hmm. she was there with her caretaker. She, she was, I, I, I feel like suffering from dementia. And uh, she stared at me. And we all know that feeling when someone's looking <laughs> at you. So I looked at her and smiled and then looked away. And, you know, I could feel that she was still <laughs> staring at me. And so I looked back up and she's still looking at me and smiling. And um, eventually got us a table, sat down at my table. My husband was waiting on our pizza. And she's looking at me still from her table. And she mouths, you're lovely. Oh. And I mouthed back, thank you. Well, that's all she took, and she came to my table. <laughs> and she told me bits and pieces of a story, and all the whole story is in the book, but bits and pieces of a story. She lived a life unbelievable. Her husband was single-handedly responsible for creating the Israeli Air Force. She was, she was Jewish, and she was from oh, Jerusalem. Wow. And... She just hinted at that. But he, he was arrested because what he did was illegal. Mm -hmm. And he supplied them with armaments left over from World War II. Mm -hmm. 
because he felt like if he didn't do that, there would be a second Holocaust. And there, there are stories, there are documentaries about him. And she gave me all these little tidbits. So this story taught me a lot about not holding my time so closely. Mm -hmm. That time is going to pass. It's going to go away. I can't get it back, which really means it's one of the most valuable things that we can give away. Yeah. And um, it showed me, put my time on the table, and whoever sits at that table, yeah. let them take it. And so I love the story of Rena, and she, she, I said, Rena, and she said, roll your arms, Rena. <laughs> wow, what um, an amazing story. Yeah, I love that story. Yeah. So yeah. what was your hardest one to write? The, the hardest chapter, hands down, would be uh, the first chapter of the book. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is really the story that caused the whole chain of events of the book to even take place. It was a very hard, you know it's a hard season of year, years when you label them and you give them a name. Mm -hmm. And so my husband and I refer to this season as the Great Humbling. Oh. And it was, it was a hard because I had to tell some personal things and you know, I, I, I would not, I, I would kind of generally tell it and my editor would say, ah, we need, I, I need more. You, you need to be more transparent. And so that was definitely the hardest chapter and the hardest chapter to let people read, yeah. especially people who know me because, you know, I wasn't transparent during that time. And it was, I chose to walk through that very lonely. And so when I finally was at the very bottom and said, I, I'm done, this, this is going to be what it will be, there was um, really in the next minute, this immediate, uh, this immediate sort of a, of a peace. It sounds hokey, but it was like a peace that came over me. And hope returned to me at that moment. And though nothing in my circumstance had changed, and it would not change for two or three more years, wow. uh, I, it, it was it, just by laying it down yeah. and turning it loose, I could then move on and up and, and wow. yeah. I think that is so brave. Just to, yeah. And I do think it makes the book more authentic because they know you're writing from a place of having been there. Yes. You know, it's not yeah. just theory. Like you, you yeah. know what it's like to be there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about um, turning loose of the comfort zone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm a woman of some years now. And uh, 61 of them to be exact. Wow. And I'm very happy for all of those years and very proud for all of those years. But it is a time in life where, you know, gravity is a real thing. <laughs> and it wants to hold us down on that couch, you know, with our cup of cocoa and a warm blanket. And every year, it's harder to sort of defy that gravity. Yeah. And this is a chapter about turning loose of my comfort zone with friends. Um, we actually took this amazing trip and I knew it was going to challenge me because it, it was to Iceland and my friend called and said mm -hmm. that I went with, she said, you know, people, I've been researching, people die there. <laughs> they fall in geothermal pools and they fall, fall through crevices in a glacier and, and we went, we went anyway and it pushed us, it was for two weeks, but uh, what I learned is that, you know, when we we really turn loose of our comfort zone when we go and experience things, new new things. When we're out of our, when we're out of where we feel most settled, when we go to fluid places where we have no idea where we're going to go. I mean, I never tried this thing called pho, the food. Do you know oh, that food? The Thai food. Oh. It's it's called it's P H O. Oh, never heard of it in my life until about. I don't know, a year ago, and a, or edamame. Oh. I mean, I didn't know what edamame was. I have a friend that actually ate the whole, <laughs> the whole thing instead of just the little bean inside. So it can be as simple as that, you know, maybe for a workaholic. It's, um, it's stopping and, and taking a walk, you know, along a beach for, um, for an introvert. Maybe it's actually engaging with people. So it doesn't have to be a big thing. Yeah. It's just to keep keep exploring, yeah. and um, that's very important to me. I think at this at this stage yeah. in life, because I want to remain interesting to my adult kids. I don't want to just talk about my heart healthy diet and my 
you know, know what made her today. What made her? I don't want to. I don't want to talk about that with them. I want to, you know, be able to engage them in interesting conversation. And so I think when we when we get outside our comfort zone. Yeah. Well, it sounds like too you have been very active. I mean, even since you turned fifty, you've just been doing all kinds of things. You know, a lot of that corresponded with my turning, starting this turning loose journey. Oh wow. Yeah. A lot of that corresponded with just my shift in the way that I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So, who would the book be for? Like, yeah. who's it intended for? Yeah. Um, I would say women ages, I don't know, 22, post college, just out of college, uh, through women that are 80. I think for younger women, there may be a few little tidbits of wisdom that they might gain from it, especially if they're raising children, because there is a chapter on uh, turning loose of my children called The Best Parts of Me. Mm -hmm. And um, it walks through the stages of, of turning loose when they go to kindergarten, turning loose mm -hmm. when they have a car, turning loose mm -hmm. when they go to college, turning loose when they marry. And um, so I feel like it, in that way, younger mamas can can maybe grab onto something from there. And then of course the busyness, I think uh, also will resonate with, yeah. but they're probably too busy to read the book. So <laughs> it's gonna come out in audio in October. So maybe they'll listen there you in, go. in Good audio. To know. Yeah, and then the, the, some of my, uh, my, my older readers, more seasoned readers um, have enjoyed reliving because it reminds them of their life. And they and they say, ah, oh, man, I saw myself in that story. Yeah. So yeah, that is beautiful. So I also like to um, end interviews with something you think listeners would be surprised to know about you. Oh goodness. Okay. Okay, this is a really weird thing, but I'll just I can't smell. Oh wow! You are my third person to meet, and that's hard to say now during COVID because people freak out. No, no, no! no. Yeah. My whole life, life. Exactly. never once. I, I can remember in elementary yeah. school agreeing uh, the kids would go in. Our this school served liver and onions one day a week, and when the kids would walk into school, they'd all go, "Ah, it smells so bad in here!" And I would go, "Yeah, it does." I had no clue what smell was. Wow. So anyway, that's that's. That's the first thing that came to mind. See, and my first thought is, oh my goodness, you can't smell some of the food, and maybe I'm, I'm better off that way. <laughs> well, you would think I would be too. You know, somebody asked me if it affected my taste, and I said, well, what, what do you think? <laughs> no, it does not. I still, I think it probably does some of the finer oh, tastes, yeah. you know, some spices, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> thank you so much for being oh, with us. We will you, include Donna. links on how to get to her books and her website in the blog post um, underneath the video. Thank you guys. Thank you for having me. Absolutely.